Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Today's program was recorded before a live audience. In this symposium about the future of food, we'll explore and diagnose the problems we face with food shortages, food insecurity, and potential crises. And we'll turn to solutions. How can we protect long-term sustainability of healthy food? And what changes do we need to be sure our system is just, sustainable, and resilient? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Future of Food Symposium. My name is Manuel Valle. I'm a senior lecturer here in the sociology department at the University of Auckland, and I'm a co-organizer for this symposium along with Maria Armudian. We have an excellent panel to discuss food-related issues. On the first panel, we have Annie Bartos, who's a lecturer in the School of Environment at this university. She's uh, co-authored articles including Food Sovereignty and the Possibilities for an Equitable, Just, and Sustainable Food System, and The Body Eating as Food Politics. Gerhard Sonderborn is a senior lecturer in the School of Population Health at the University of Auckland. Uh, he's also an epidemiologist, and he's co-authored articles including Low Sugar Nutrition Policies and Dental Caries, as well as Sugar Dental Caries and the Incidence of Acute Rheumatic Fever, a cohort study of Maori and Pacific children. Additionally, he's the founder of the nonprofit group Fighting Sugar and Soft Drinks, also known as FIZ. Daniel Hikaroa is a senior lecturer in the School of Maori Studies and Pacific Studies at the University of Auckland. He's co-authored articles including Ensuring Objectivity by Applying the Maori Model to Assess the Post-Disaster-Affected Environments of the 2011 Rena Disaster in the Bay of Plenty, New Zealand. Mike Joy is a senior lecturer at the Institute of Agriculture and Environment at Massey University. He flew up today to be with us, so thank you for that, Mike. He authored the book Polluted Inheritance, New Zealand's Freshwater Crisis, and co-authored articles including New Zealand Dairy Farming, Milking our Environment for All It's Worth. And with that, I hand it over to Maria. Oh, thank you, Manuel. So I thought we should start with the big picture and with kind of the big problems that we're facing in terms of our long-term sustainability and availability of food. And so this uh, interaction between the environment and food production is something that is really key to that. Mike Joy, this is a big part of what you've been studying. I wonder if you could start us by laying out these interactions and what's happening and how they're feeding each other. If sure. Feeding yeah. was <laughs> yeah, carefully placed in that sentence. Yeah, yeah. Don't be fooled by my name. Um, I should be called. I should be called Doctor Doom. Um, <laughs> So the, um, the other chapter that I've recently written is called Nitrogen, Our Deadly uh, Addiction, which is in the Land and uh, Food Alp Annual from Massey University, where I'm a bit of a thorn in the side of an agricultural university pointing out the impacts of agriculture. I guess that I just, you know, to start out and kind of, it's very hard to separate out New Zealand from the global issues. We're very much a global producer of food, so I, I have to kind of switch between the two of them. But I wanted to give some kind of feel for the the kind of place that we are with food and globally, and and, the, and we're in dire straits because of a few things. But I'm a freshwater ecologist who's come to food because when I look at the impacts on our freshwaters, it comes mostly uh, from farming, from food production that causes our problems in freshwater. And it was just going from that to look for the cause that got me into the whole you know, understanding the, the food system. So I guess the one statistic, or there's a few of them that I'm going to give you, but I think the one that puts our problems into some kind of understanding is that around 6 billion of us on this planet get our food from fossil fuels. We're basically eating oil. So the Harbour Bosch process where we found a way of converting um, fossil fuels into nitrogen fertiliser is what grows the food that feeds most of the population on this planet. So the, the green revolution, the fossil fuel inputs into our food system has allowed this massive population boom, and, and, and it's coming to an end in, in a number of ways. One of the big ones, and, and very few people seem to understand this, is that the energy return on investment. So how much energy we have to put in to get the energy back out again, which is the energy that we need to stay alive. And as that reduces, and it is reducing, it's gone from around 30 to 1, so 30 units of energy for every one that we invest in getting it. Globally, it's below 15, some say as low as 10. As 
that number goes down and you have to put more energy into getting the energy, then what happens is that it gets, you need exponentially more energy. So even if the population's, population of the planet wasn't growing, and it is, I remind people, by 80 million extra mouths to feed a year, but even if it wasn't, the fact that we need more energy to make energy means that once we get past that point, then to, to keep the same amount, we need so much more, and it exponentially goes up. I think the best way to understand it is if you... If your car, the nearest service station to you at the moment to fill up your car is maybe 10 kilometres away, and, and that's where it's been, and, and in the next few years it's going to get up to 100 kilometres away. So you're travelling 200 kilometres there and back to fill up your car to go 600. Then we're getting close to the point where it doesn't matter how much the fuel costs, it's just not worth going there, and we start to get into real trouble. And, and a big part of that is animal agriculture, and I think the best statistic to understand just how pervasive and how our food system overwhelms the planet, if you take the biomass of humans and our animals, the animals we eat and our pets and, and the animals we rely on, and in one hand the biomass of those mammals and the biomass of wild mammals on the planet, the ratio, and this was in 2010, so it'd be worse than that now, was 98% us and what we eat and 2% wild animals. And when you get that through your head, then you realise just, well, for one, why we have a biodiversity crisis like no other time in, in history, but also just how we dominate this planet and food systems. And then there's a whole lot of spin-offs that come from, from that. So thinking about things like area of land needed. So if you're talking about for, for one gram of protein, you need one square metre if it's beef versus 0.02 of a square metre if it's rice. That, you know, that kind of kind of ratio... I've just done some, to come back to the New Zealand situation, I've just done some water footprinting work on dairying in Canterbury, and it takes 195,000 litres of water to make one kilogram of milk solids. And it takes, well, that works out to 13,600 litres of water to make one litre of milk. And the biggest part of that is the grey water footprint. It's how much water you need to dilute that water, that, that nitrogen that you've polluted the groundwater and the surface water with. And it's about 35 times overshoot is another way of looking at it. So you either need 35 times more rainfall in Canterbury to dilute that much nitrogen, or you need 35 times less nitrogen in Canterbury to have livable, healthy ecosystems and drinking water there. And I can see very soon... And this may be part of the solution, is that every product will have a water footprint on the back of it. So you'll be able to read the water footprint and the energy footprint. That The energy used in creating that will be a key part to consumer choices on that kind of thing. So there's lots and lots of, of, of statistics, but the understanding that the greenhouse gases that come from agriculture are mostly from methane, and, and that figure that we get for New Zealand of 49% of our greenhouse gas equivalents coming from agriculture, I think is a gross underestimate because, and that's bad enough, but it turns out that, that the figure that you will have heard of, of of methane being 21 times more of a greenhouse gas than carbon, with 31, 21 tonnes to equal one tonne of carbon, that is averaged over 100 years. We don't have 100 years to think about this. Because it's a short-term gas, that, that's why it averages down to 21. If you take it over 20 years, it's 86 times more of a greenhouse gas than carbon. So if you applied those numbers, then you would soon see that the agricultural part of our greenhouse gas emissions is way worse than half of our... So, Mike, Joy, a couple of things that yeah. I read in your work. One, this was also related to dairy farming and nitrogen. You wrote about things like dead zones, and you also wrote about the sort of feedback of climate change and how that affects food as well. Um, so I wanted to see if you could sort of talk us through these things like, so we've got pollution, we've got the water, you've, you've talked about the water footprint, but there's also this these other problems that you didn't mention just now. And then if you could give us a sense of how urgent it is, what we're dealing with. And if we were looking at a time span, you know, which of these problems is going to be the one that really creates a food crisis? I think they all go together. And, I, you know, it's very hard to separate them out. But the reality is that if we're going to feed this 
burgeoning population, the only way we're going to do that is that animals cannot be in the picture. I mean, that's the simplest thing to start off with because the inefficiencies, whether it's land or the methane or everything that you look at, the pollution, is so much higher with animals. And it, even if you, if you forget climate change and you forget everything else, just the efficiency of energy transfer with the amount of energy we come in, have coming into the planet versus the, just the basal metabolic rate of energy use of humans, then if animals are in there, it doesn't, the sums don't work. By the time you get to 9 billion, there just isn't enough energy. So you're to saying we that. need to go vegetarian individually? Well, well I think that's the, that's the biggest difference every individual one of us can make is to get animals out of our diet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you can frame it as a choice, but we won't have the choice very much longer. It's a, it's a we must or... We'll start, you know, it's as simple as that. Annie Bartos, this is a perfect lead into the work that you do, both with the, you know, political economy of food, but also with this individual choice, the micro within the macro. How would you respond to this? Thank you. It's great to be here. So the way that I see it is that we need to be thinking about the food system as it relates to p- wider political economic structures, but also then how those political economic structures intersect with the body. And so... I think in some ways saying that we all need to stop eating meat. I teach also a class, and I think by the end of my semester, my students say, Annie, I don't know what to eat. What should I eat? And I like to challenge them to think that it's actually not as straightforward as simply reducing X or increasing Y, because those are rooted in systems of inequality, those are rooted in systems of capitalism, those are rooted in systems of inequality, for better or for worse. What I'm really interested in thinking about is how do our food practices and our eating habits in particular, how can they reduce suffering and inequality? How can they reduce violence, basically, of the body and non-human bodies and the planet that we're living in and the future generations, the violence that we're just doing mindlessly through our mindless eating, for example. And, you know, having those statistics, I'm, I'm a qualitative geographer. I, I love scientists giving us data. It's so interesting to me. But sometimes I'm really overwhelmed with numbers. And I, it doesn't really make that much sense to me in terms of what am I supposed to do with these crazy numbers that tell me all of this water goes into producing this pound of, of animal flesh. And I think that if we, if we kind of think about our bodies as eating bodies, as bodies that are then related to those leaders and leaders and leaders of water, or those um, mines that are that we're destroying just to get more phosphorus or nitrogen or whatever it is that we're putting onto the, the soil, that's then killing all of those bacteria that live in the soil that we absolutely need to survive. I feel like those kind of interrelations of the wider political economic system really, they're hard, they're sticky, they're not straightforward, there's not a whole lot of answers, but they're things that we should be thinking about as opposed to saying, you know, let's cut X and then we can increase, you know, our kale nutrition content and then therefore we're going to have all these farmers growing kale. But, you know, maybe next year we, we might really be interested in spinach instead of kale. And so what are all those farmers going to do now that they've been, you know, investing in kale, for example? So I think that, yeah, I think that those kinds of recognizing that bodies are involved and people are involved in those the ways that we relate to the food system are intersectionally related based on our gender, our class, our racial, ethnicity, et cetera. So that would also imply farm workers, people who Absolutely. work on the farms, people who serve the food, and all of those sort of societal systems that are involved in the making of the food that then we make a decision about. Well, I couldn't have asked for a better segue to Dan Hikaroa and then systems. <laughs> Dan Hikaroa is both a geographer and a Maori scholar, and so those two things intersect actually quite beautifully um, with Katia Katanga as well. How do you see this? I'm glad that you've raised those points, Annie, around understanding that there's power, economic and social structures that dominate but are almost invisible at the same time. And so it's those invisible dominant structures that we need to address that have led to those outcomes and those dire statistics that that Mike shared with us. So 
Kaitiakitanga is a principle and is a practice drawn from Mātauranga Māori, the indigenous knowledge, born out of generations of having lived within uh, these environments and born out of an ontology that is, is a kinship-based relationship. So when, when we talk about food, we're actually talking about our kin. And the approach, and I should say this was traditionally, uh, the approach was that you are eating your kin, um, but your kin are there to provide sustenance for you as part of that relationship. And kaitiakitanga is about balancing that relationship. And so everything you do is about balance. So there is the practical implementation of knowing how to farm kumara, um, but then there's the realisation that you're doing that from within a, a structure that says, hey, this is related to us in this part of the whakapapa. Interestingly, many academics, scholars, and even grassroots or flax roots uh, communities around the world now are recognising that that worldview where we see ourselves as part of the ecosystem and not as um, abstracted from it is critical in changing the way we think about everything we do, including food. And what's more, people may have felt they weren't part of that debate and weren't part of that indigeneity because they didn't themselves feel like they were part of an indigenous culture. But we are all indigenous to this planet and we need to start drawing from that indigenous approach because this is the only one we're getting, folks. And so I believe the principles and some of the practices that have been born out of things like kaitiakitanga, and this is just for the New Zealand context, there will be equivalents around the world, um, could well be some of the places where we start to try and find those multi-pronged solutions. And, and I'm also glad that there was mention of... of consumers and, and the capitalist markets. We have the technology that Mike described which enables us to convert hydrocarbons into nitrogen. That enables us to do it. But we have the capitalist structure which encourages us to do it for profit. Neither of those are really consistent with about nourishing our bodies in a kinship-based relationship with everything we see, feel, hear and touch around us. Um, and I believe it's both the approach and some of that knowledge that will may provide some of the solutions as we move forward, Maria. Dan Hugo, one other thing I wanted to see if you would address for us is this concept of food sovereignty. Like what are we talking about and how does it apply here? In the New Zealand context, the concept of food sovereignty was captured in the Waitangi Tribunal Report, Y262, Ko Aotearoa Tēnei, where it says that um, the treaty relationship was one that allowed the Crown to govern, but Māori to retain tino rangatiratanga over all their taonga. Um, and tino rangatiratanga, autonomy, decision-making powers, there's been many debates and many courses and many PhDs written on that particular thing. Let's park that for one second. Um, taonga, often understood as treasure. Um, I like to think of it as to be treasured. Because treasure is something that you kind of jewels and stuff and you put in a treasure chest. Something you treasure can be a river, can be um, going for a walk on the beach. And so food sovereignty fits into that concept of, of that report, which means having the ability to make the decisions on the food that you have a kinship-based relationship with. And so for food sovereignty in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that is based firmly within uh, the treaty discussion, but another great thing of that Ko Aotearoa Tene report said it's time we move beyond um, pointing fingers about past wrongdoings, not forgetting they happen, but start to try and seek mutually beneficial relationships as we move forward. And the key thing for that is for the Crown to recognise Māori to have sovereignty. What does that practically mean? It means that... Um, the kumara seeds that are based overseas and that people deem to have ownership of, they don't actually belong to them. The sovereignty belongs to, to Māori of New Zealand. Um, and whilst that does tend into a rights-based argument, which I try and never get in, to get into, um, because Māori only ever understood rights alongside responsibilities, which seems to be forgotten in a lot of the, the legal systems, in this mutually beneficial Aotearoa New Zealand, 
having uh, rangatiratanga or food sovereignty over Komara, for example, could provide us a means forward. And that also segues into uh, removing the commodification of food, not by smashing the capitalist system, but by starting to grow your own without the need for nitrogen. So we've got a worm farm over in Māori Studies. We've got a mātakai. We've got our own vegetable garden. We dine in there daily. You are listening to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Well, Gerhard Sunborn. So let's look at this from the population health perspective, issues around food security, issues around public health. How do you see this? Okay, yeah, so um, I thought when you asked when will this crisis hit, I think we're right in the middle of it right now. You know, in particular, I look around CVD and heart disease and type 2 diabetes and things like that, and I think um, you know, the crisis we have is that we're, um, we're swimming in sugar here in New Zealand but in most of the Western world as well. And so I think, um, you know, I understand if there's, there's not just one thing that we should do, but I, I'd strongly advocate that we should target sugar and reduce sugar intake um, as a leading priority for our, our health system and our food system. But I do understand that by targeting one thing, um, there can be unexpected consequences. Over the past two to three decades, saturated fat and salt has been targeted by public health and nutrition um, as a means to reduce obesity epidemic and CVD risk and things like that. And Heart disease rates have come down and a few other good things have happened. But unfortunately, I think with industry having to strip a lot of their products of saturated fat and salt, they've replaced it with something else, and that something else has been sugar. So sugar intake across most Western worlds has increased astronomically over the past two or three decades. So I think, and that's driven huge increases in um, unhealthy weight. Type 2 diabetes here in New Zealand, we have... 250,000 diagnosed type 2 diabetics, a further 100,000 don't know they have it, and we've got about another 1.1 million who uh, have pre-diabetes, so a large proportion of them will transition to type 2 diabetes, so so that's one thing that I think high sugar intake is driving. We have over over 5,050 children who are five years old or under who need to be hospitalised and put under general anaesthetic to get multiple tooth extractions. So those are some of the things. So I think we, we do need to um, focus, and there's some simplicity in focusing on one thing. And when, when you talked about balance um, before, there is no balance with sugar intake here and in Western societies. From our latest National Nutrition Survey, we know that children consume about 30 teaspoons of sugar per day. The American Heart Association recommend they should only consume about three teaspoons of sugar. We have products like baby foods with the Plunkett endorsement on them that recommend for a four- to six-month-old baby they, they have a, a fruit puree that's been concentrated, boiled down, there's four teaspoons of sugar in it. For goodness sakes, that's four- to six-month-olds. Our cereals have about three or four teaspoons per serve. Uh, when you move on to, to breakfast cereal, um, move on to sugary drinks and juices, it's quite easy to see how we consume around 30 teaspoons of sugar per day. So moving kind of around to the politics, politics needs to, to be acknowledged, and I think our politicians need to acknowledge their role in, in the food system. We've held symposiums every year for the past four years, and we've invited members of the, uh, the Minister of Health and members of the previous government to come to our symposiums around sugar and the, the problems it causes. Not once have they attended. Um, in 2011 and 2016, previous Prime Minister John Key and Jerry Brownlee and Stephen Joyce attended the Coca-Cola factory uh, on, on two occasions for openings, yet not once had they thought over the last four years it was worth coming to, to our symposium around sugar and health. So I think I'm hoping that um, with the new government uh, they may take a more proactive role. So It yeah. sounds like the government is wrapped up in a system that... Our other three panelists have described as harming in multiple ways. So this sort of neoliberal capitalist system. Um, so, and, and with blinders on, that they're not seeing the problem outside of the economics. So they're, it's sort of disembodied, bifurcated in a way. 
Now, I don't know about focusing on one thing. Maybe, Mike Joy, do you think we should focus on one thing or do you think we need to take a systems approach? What I was saying about animals, it's not a choice. I don't think Annie's talking about a choice. I'm not talking about, I'm saying we don't have a choice. We can choose between spinach and kale, but we can't keep having animals because we'll all starve if we do that and we, we won't have any drinkable water and we won't have oceans that have life in them if we keep going. And I think that it's a bit like sugar in that... It's not necessary, but it makes money, you know. And, and so I give the examples the EU, we haven't done this stuff here, but in the EU they looked at the value of nitrogen fertiliser in their food production, and it was somewhere between 20 and $80 billion long term is what it brings into their food system. But it costs between 70 and $320 billion for health costs and pollution costs. It's a complete loser. It's exactly the same as dairy in this country, in that if you actually do the sums on the externalities you wouldn't do it. You know, it's, it's the capitalist system that drives stupid decisions like that. So I'm sure it's the same for sugar. You can make money out of it, but we, we can fix nitrogen naturally through plants, through clover. That's what we used to do. But there's no money in that. But if you can create something and then sell it to people and have a big fertiliser industry in this country, then, then it's, that's the way we go. So in terms of politics, food politics, what do you see that needs to be done? Like, what's missing the, the valuing, uh, including externalities in the pricing of things. And I'm sure it would be the same if you built the health externalities into sugar, then taxed it somehow. I mean, I don't know the process. There's all, so many ways of, of doing it, but we've got to get those prices and that reality into the, into the balance. Yeah. Annie Bartos, what do you think? I think your question, Maria, is what needs to be included in the food politics. I think absolutely the externalities make... A hundred percent. That makes complete sense. I think we also need to be thinking about who's disposable in this process, right? Whose bodies are deemed worthy of engaging with those fertilizers and putting those onto the fields and whose bodies can then sit in their comfortable restaurant where they don't really understand what's even on the menu, but they think it's good for them. And so, you know, those bodies are deemed worthy and, and valuable in some ways. And and I think that a, a politics of food, a food politics needs to look at all of the ways that the food system creates and destroys communities, perpetuates inequalities, keeps systems of oppression front and center. And then therefore we all become depoliticized about the food that we're eating. So it does seem like it's a choice, unfortunately, when it's not. Actually, like you were saying, Mike, it's, it shouldn't be a choice. It's, it's not a choice. But when, it's, when we're so removed from these bigger systems of oppression and inequality and injustice, then we don't, it's not political. You can make some silly decision and think you're changing the world when you're actually not, right? Dan Hikaroa to you. Governance, politics. The trouble with politics is they get voted in and do what they like. And it's a popularity contest every X number of years. And the challenge for us is that these realities that I think you're all here to hear about, um, and that Mike and, and Annie and... and what do I Mike? Gerhard. Gerhard, yeah, have, have eloquently articulated are the problems that our politicians need to hear. Actually, we care about this, and we're going to vote for people who are going to find solutions. So the, the politics is we need to move beyond the, the voting cycle and start thinking about the future, literally the future of food, because the future of the planet is, is inextricably linked to it. You are listening to The Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian, and we're talking about the future of food. I'd like to start taking some questions from the audience, and I'd actually like to start with um, Manuel. Gerhard, so we're, we're talking about the food externalities, which I, uh, Mike, I absolutely agree. I think that's something that we need to start integrating into the actual cost so that uh, we have fair-based foods, priced foods. Um, and... Sugar tax, which is something Gerhardt's group has been working towards, um, in some way tries to capture an ext- or try to impose an externality or reflect an externality. And, and I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the process that you've tried and the difficulties, the obstacles that you've encountered in trying to pursue that and perhaps the things that you're hopeful about. Okay, yeah, so I suppose um, we, we established FIS, which is a public health advocacy group, and to, I suppose, educate um, the general public 
in, in what are the issues, what are the costs of high sugar consumption and, and sugary drink intake. Um, you know, I've learned a lot about the environmental impact of, of beef just here and now. But I think we need to, we need to politicise the public and get them up to speed on, on what are the effects of consuming particular foods um, on the environment, on our health and things like that. Um, you know, we, we think that a tax needs to be part of the solution. Um, I just read a paper was released earlier, I think this week, about the tax that's just been introduced uh, in the UK on sugary drinks. Now, um, they, they projected that that would uh, earn about $520 million in its first year of the tax, but because le- it, it was given two years lead up before it was brought in, uh, industry has already reformulated so many products, it's taken 30,000 tonne of sugar out of consumption each year already, and, um, and now they're predicting that it will only earn 240 million. So a tax is a hugely strong tool to change behaviour, and that of, of industry too, and gets them to reformulate and bring things down. So, so you know, I think fiscal measures around taxes are one thing, is, is a key thing, but yeah, um, advocacy and, and bringing the public along and educating, I think, is key to, to getting change. Um, but, you know, we're just going to keep pushing, and we think it's not a matter of if, but when, and, um, yeah, it may be a bit longer than anticipated. I'm going to ask a crazy question, and then I want to see uh, what questions you guys have. And this is primarily to Mike Joy because he is doing the quantification. Suppose we just keep going as business as usual. How long do we have? I mean, it's just it's which which bit's going to hit us first is the is the thing. And I mean, it's but like um, Gerhard talking about the tax. Um, you know, they anticipate it, and then change happens. And so, you know, it's really hard to to guess. But if we if we just business as, as usual is going to mean just more and more polluted rivers. Just I guess the reality that hits me every day how we refuse to let go our everything we have. And all we are doing is passing this on to the next generation. Polluted rivers, polluted oceans, you know, the whole thing is just a a generational selfishness that we've got to do something about. Or a denial. Denial. Well, it's definitely lots of that as well, yeah. Well, let's uh, open it up and see what questions have arisen. Um, Hi. um, I'm really enjoying this discussion. Um, I'm involved in a community garden out west, and um, what I see is that... It's communities that need to be working on all of this and working together and getting to know each other and building food together. Um, the information about, you know, sugar tax and whatever, when I'm down at the supermarket, I mean, the people there aren't getting the information. Also, what I find is people prefer to have a Coke with natural sugar. Let's face it, it's natural. Then It might be processed, but it's come from the ground. Uh, then having artificial sweetness and things like that. And... The other thing that I notice happening, more land is being sold off, and nobody seems to care about that, because how are we going to feed ourselves? So I'm really you know, concerned about community working together and learning about all these things and helping each other. So mm. I'd just like to hear comments on that. Yeah, so um, anybody like to respond to that? I just wanted to plug the um, Living the Change documentary that's, that's doing the rounds, and you can find it online. More and more people that don't go to the supermarket to buy food is going to be one of the good ways we can change the bad behaviour. Like yeah. going to farmers markets and growing yep. your own. Yeah, yeah. Like those two things. Annie Bartos. Um, I think just to add on to that, I think it's really excellent and inspiring and exciting to see community activists getting together and doing really good work. Absolutely. I think um, just to kind of remind us that there are still, not to keep saying this, but there are still different bodies doing that work and that some bodies are excluded from that kind of positive, feel-good gardening work, for example. And some people don't have access to those gardens or are living in isolated areas or living in apartment blocks. And, you know, we have incredible migration coming into the city every day where people are losing their sovereign knowledge, their food sovereignty knowledge, their knowledge that they are bringing from other countries, but don't have access to land. And if we're going to talk about access to land, what a big elephant in the room, right? Like how many, yeah, I'm not even going to go there, but access to land is really important. And it's, it's not just about who has access to their own private garden in the backyard or who has access to a community garden maybe within their neighborhood, but 
what are we doing with this land? And, and really, who's excluded from doing what with that land? And in the meanwhile, yeah, we're continuing to destroy it, like Mike's been saying. We're just destroying this land and building on, on, beautiful, so, on beautiful soils. We're just building stuff. You know, what's the value of that? What's the externalities of that? And before I go to Gerhard Sunborn, and I want you to respond to that, this act of destroying the soil itself was something, Mike Joy, that you wrote about but didn't really talk about here, which is there's a certain point when soil can't feed us anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's the point that we're, that we're getting to in many places. The, the area size getting smaller because we keep building on it and we keep deserted, you know, making it into deserts and salinating it. That, yeah, it gets smaller and smaller as we need more and more of it. We're going in the opposite direction, yeah. So it can't give us the nutrition anymore. Yeah, it can't grow anything anymore. Gerhard Sunborn, what about this inequality issue that Annie has alluded to, access to land, access to gardens, being able to participate? Mm. I think realistically, um, with with how um, society develops, few and fewer people are going to be able to produce food from community gardens or gardens themselves. So I think um, because of that, we need to have really good, strong policy and regulation from our governments that protects fertile lands. Like I understand out Pukekohe, which is some of the most fertile soil in New Zealand, it's um, been tagged for development and we'll find it probably hard to, to feed our, our own population when um, lands like that disappear. I think the value in community gardens and things like that is especially, I think, for our young and for our children to, to know how and where food actually comes from um, and things like that. But, but I think, yeah, to, to, to hold governments and, and regulated body, uh, regulatory bodies to account to ensure that they protect, um, protect our, our fertile lands is, is, is key. You are listening to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian, and we're talking about the future of food. I see some questions coming on. What's your views on how the attitudes of an increasingly affluent China can influence for the benefit of New Zealand uh, its agricultural practice? Yeah, it's a really important question since that is a big part of what our economy, our economy is built on. You know, that's a really good question. I'm going to throw down into the middle uh, of you two, uh, Mike Joy and Dan Hikaroa. How would you respond to that? I'll start with that. Like I say, supposedly dairy's worth $17 billion to this country and in, in overseas earnings. Most of it is going to, well, a big chunk of it, I can't get any actual figures, but a, a large proportion, more than half, goes to replace breast milk. So, you know, you know any claims of feeding the world is kind of dubious when you talk about replacing breast milk. But if, so, so you, you, we say that it's a great income earner, but then we forget the $24 billion worth of cost to clean up that mess. So, you know, I just, I just have trouble with that. I, that it's worth this much money. It's only worth that much money because we ignore one side of the of the balance sheet. But then, yeah, and I think I mean I work with with Landcorp, our biggest farmer. I'm in the environmental reference group there, and really a lot of what we're thinking and doing is about appealing to the very rich people in the world by providing top, you know, the the extra value add, you know, top of the line products traceable back to clean green New Zealand which is kind of you know everyone can see the obvious advantage that we have with our clean green image the very biggest value add we have is the very thing that we're trashing at the same time so it's an what I call an own goal for agriculture and the the way that we won't face up to those those challenges and and do it so yeah I mean I think there's yeah there's but but at the moment, there's not that consumer choice, I don't think, by those Chinese, uh, you know, uh, purchases and somehow we have to link those two things together. Yeah. So, t- to me, the fundamental thing missing from that argument is about the difference between food and money. One of them will nourish us, mm-hmm. one of them isn't very palatable. <laughs> so, if if... The difference here is the point that Mike was making is, yes, it does make $17 billion. It could be costing us 24 but actually it's food we're after because food is what nourishes us. Um, and so maybe if we focused on making less milk for food for the local market, 
Um, we might actually be better off when all those externalities are involved, where our farmers are still um, surviving, and so are our rivers, and so is our land, and so are our coasts, and so are our oceans, and so are our people. I mean, I'm from dairy farming family. I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else here. I'm living it. Um, but I think the difference is one of those will sustain us and one of those won't. We've got the choice. Thank you for um, all the um, wonderful uh, discussion today. I'm very interested in uh, this idea of responsible leadership in the food space. And, you know, what I've been hearing today um, kind of alludes to this question of, you know, how does this sense of shared responsibility, because I think, you know, that's kind of what, what we've been alluding to is, you know, we might take responsibility for our own community and, and the uh, industrialists, uh, so to speak, or, or, you know, people who invested in, um, you know, chemical-intensive uh, agricultural practices, you know, they might take responsibility for their bottom line. Um, but I really want to hear from you. How does this sense of shared responsibility arise? Because, you know, you've alluded, you've said that there is a growing movement of, you know, um, uh, fair food and more just food. Um, but then you've also, like, some, some of you guys have also said that, you know, the, as society develops, um, less and less people will be able to engage in community gardening. So there seems to be, like, different images of the future that seem to be, for me, creating a, a difficulty in creating a shared sense of responsibility. What is, you know, a common sense of responsibility, a shared sense of responsibility between those bodies who are perhaps being treated unfairly by the current system um, and, you know, uh, the dominant system. Um, so how do you see that sense of responsibility to be arising? It sounds like it was Annie Bartos. I think that's a brilliant question. It's a really, really important question. Um, I think that one way we can think more about our shared responsibility, I, I think, is in thinking about relations of care. And caring relations are not just about what and who we care for, but also what and who we are not caring for. And I think that once we kind of start to unravel these particular caring relationships, and especially you know, what we put into our bodies as eaters and the impacts that then has on these varieties of externalities, I think, ideally, <laughs> illuminates um, some sort of kind of map. I mean, I am a geographer, but it kind of, you know, kind of illuminates a little bit of a map of, of these power relations, of these caring relations and non-caring relations. And then that can help us see where our responsibility is. Yes, it's in individual actions and in individual choices, but it definitely comes back to these politics and these policies that are being raised and who we're electing and what kinds of things we're holding our elected officials accountable for. We have a responsibility in democracy just as much as those people we vote in. And those, vo those people, like you said, they're going to disappear after however many months, hopefully some of us are still counting on some people being <laughs> removed before their term is up, but, you know, I, di I digress. Um, no names, but his initials <laughs> are Donald Trump. <laughs> but I, I do think that that shared responsibility is as much ours as it is those we vote in, and it's also, yeah, um, how we kind of perpetuate this and continue to make it an apolitical thing. The more that we politicize food, the more that we bring the politics of food to the to attention of everybody, those eaters that don't know necessarily about the taxes or don't necessarily know about, you know, what candidate sits on what platform, um, I, I think that that's where we get in our show. Or how, as you alluded to earlier, the structure of the society, including the structure of the buildings and the structure of the industries, and how all of that limits our ability to actually participate in a meaningful way in a political system. I'm the political scientist over here. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the $12 cauliflower. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think I think we're going to have opportunity, and maybe this is going um, to you, Mike, a bit as well. I think we're going to have opportunity as the $12 cauliflower keeps popping up. The, I'm alluding to a couple of months ago, there were some weather events 
that precipitated, I guess, a bunch of crops being ruined. And if you wanted a cauliflower at the grocery store, it was $12 a piece. And that, and I, that was shocking to me. And I thought, oh, what an opportunity to have this conversation about our system that's broken and not going to work in a, in a world where uh, there's moisture and the atmosphere keeps increasing. And we have these bigger weather events. And that's what I wanted to ask you guys about. Are we going to have opportunity going forward like that? to where we can educate people in a real way. It, it really hits when you see a $12 cauliflower and you're a vegetarian. It's sort of the merging of the economic system and the food system, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Mike Joy. Well, that's really, really difficult because part of our problem is that we are used to cheap food, and cheap food is driving so much of these problems. And, and so I'd rather we, because I'm rich enough to afford $12 cauliflowers, then <laughs> if we all ate $12 cauliflowers, then I'm sure we wouldn't have the same problems. It's that, so, so if you leave the system how it is and let the market rule and, and under a capitalist system, we're just going to have, I mean, all of the technology I see developing is around um, robots to do everything on farms. It'll be self-drive tractors, huge farms, massive uh, amount of fossil fuels going into harvesting and all that kind of thing to make a cheap product. Whereas the future, and, and this, is, this can be a managed future, or this is definitely what we'll end up with, is that we go back to, to very, very diverse you know, farming systems, much more like permaculture than anything we have at the moment, where many, many more of us are involved in growing food, and, and so many different things happen on a piece of land. I mean, that's what we're working with Landcorp about, is that... You sh- there's a lot of infrastructure tied up in dairy sheds and things like that. We shrink the herds in around those and we diversify from the edge working in and it will mean you can't have a dairy farmer who's also a beekeeper and an arborist and all that. You can't be all those things. It has to be shared and, it, and, it, and then you get that kind of much more uh, of a community running the whole thing. So we, we can choose that and it's a really nice system if we just let it go, we're going to come back to that, you know, probably after some major wars and a lot of people being killed, and we'll end up that through necessity. We, can, we could do it nicely in the meantime if we, if we choose to. But let me open it up to the panelists and see if you guys would like to respond to that first. Well, I mean, one of the things that I see is that the things, the food that I want is fresh and local and you know, un, un messed with. I want real food. But if you're this little country down the bottom of the world, then how do you get your fresh, you know, beautiful, you know, just straight out of the ground salad or whatever, you know, that, that so that's not an option when it comes to exporting. So we can only, so what we do at the moment is we put massive amounts of fossil fuels into drying out our milk to turn it into a nice little light powder so we can shift it, ship it overseas. And so we take what's a really nice product and then turn it into something else. So, I mean, that's just an added difficulty for us being so so distant and so reliant on fossil fuels to transport our food. Um, so, you know, that's... And, you know, balancing against that is that, you know, the fact that tourism now earns more than agriculture and, and, so, and people don't come here to see polluted rivers and things like that. We're kind of lucky that... The conservation estate is, is amazing, and then it's just don't please don't look down the bottom ends of our rivers because you know we'll just keep you up there in the in the national parks, and and then you can put blinkers on. We'll take you to the airport and fly you out of here because we don't want you to see the rest of it. I mean, it's a huge it's a huge difficulty. There's advantages and disadvantages. That's what I'm saying. It's really really tricky. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So let's see what we can fit in. Hi, um, thank you, everyone. It's Very lucky for me, I'm sort of doing my entire master's on food issues, and this has come at a perfect time. Um, One of the things that just came up, which I think is interesting, is, um, Annie, you said about sort of creating this map. And I think the issue is is that every day when I get up and sort of survey the news for what food issues we're deciding to talk about this morning, um, I think a map actually exists. We know that, um, and literally geographically and to do with bodies, we know, you know, that 22,000 cows are about to die. We know children have dental issues in certain regions. We know that if you, uh, like, our government measures your health and your, uh, like, obesity statistics dependent on socioeconomics, where you live in the regions and so forth. In fact, we have a very clear map 
about our environment, about our population health. But these, each of these things exist in their sort of areas. They're in one article or in their one thing. How do we, and not just here, which is obviously which we can all recognise, but how do you engage the public to show that each of these things are closely connected, um, even if they appear maybe separate, that the health of the animals on our farms, of our soil and of our people um, are a matter of connection and even into the economics of the affordability. A few tax, we know that tax also affects the um, poorer parts of our population and not. How do you, what, what do we do, I think? <laughs> well, I think we have multiple scholars to answer that question, all different parts. Gerhard, do you want to start with the population health part of it? Yeah, again, I suppose I've said it before. Um, you know, we've got to, got to educate our public. Um, we've got to speak to our own friends and families about the issues and, um, and politicise each other around those issues. I think um, the, the more the public and, and people understand the, the, the connections between economics, our, our farms, water, oral health and, and type 2 diabetes and things like that, the more likely we are to, um, to, to see some, some political um, pressure be put on our, our leaders. And, and, yeah. My joy? Oh, yeah, I mean, I could sh- I've, uh, a map I use a lot in my talks is a map of nitrate levels in our rivers. And, and you put it, the map of intensive farming in New Zealand and the map of nitrate in our rivers overlay. I, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. It's as clear as that. And yet, you know, how many people know about that, how to get it out there? And, and if I've learned anything over you know, a couple of decades of this is that governments only respond to what's in the news. And so it's really the, the way to make change and, you know, politically in, in that field is to, to make a lot of noise and to, to you know, get it, get it in their faces in the media. Yeah. Dan Hikarua? Yeah, so one of the approaches is um, maybe drawn out of a Māori philosophy called kiota kitai, um, literally to mountains to sea, but Conceptually, everything we do on the land is connected to the rivers, which is connected to the oceans. And so all those individual um, mappings, as you mentioned in those different articles, can be brought together under that conceptualisation. But if you look at the real big post-treaty settlement entities, um, they are the ones that are really looking to this, Kiota Kitai, um, and some research also going underway in Sustainable Seas with some colleagues that are here that are talking soon. Um, around conceptions of the blue economy, we are really looking to ex- um, account for those externalities and understand that nothing happens in isolation. It's a system here, and we need to understand all moving parts of that system, but mapping and understanding those comp- compartments is critical, but also about conceptually bringing them together. So, Kilda. Andy Bartos. Yeah, thank you. That's really important. Um, I think people like Mike Joy are really good at this, at being the critic and the conscience of society, really taking that on board as academics. I, I think that most of us in this room who, who might be in a privileged position that have academic pos- positions, we should and can do a lot more to help educate. That's not the only solution, but I think it is really important, and I think like Mike is a great example of that. Um, I think that we also, in reading these maps and seeing these maps, I completely agree with you, but I, I think that one of the things that we do is we, we're we too fast. Our society is too fast. We're doing things way, way, way too fast so that we don't have to really pay attention. And so we can absorb these quick tidbits of information and then out of sight, out of mind. And I think that one of our challenges as a society interested in social change is we need to slow down. We need to be present. We need to be embodied. We need to actually see and feel what is, what's our reaction to these different articles that we're reading. And then I think, I mean, I do think that once we kind of go inward and actually acknowledge that we do have feelings that come up, we do can, we can kind of see how these are cultural and also political and social and environmental. Then I think it's easier to figure out what to do and how to connect those dots and see the relationalities between what seem at first completely isolated issues. Absolutely, you're right. But I think that, um, yeah, we need, to, we need to really pay attention. And it's our jobs to help educate, but it's everyone's job to just be present. 
So um, Gerhard Sumborn, Mike Joy, Dan Hikaroa, Annie Bartos, I thank you so very much for your time and your wisdom. And that's it for today's show. Thank you to all of our guests and to those who make this program possible. To Sad Dongre, our webmaster, Ankine Arasian, Melissa Chiprin, Anais Amin, Mike Hurst, and Tim Page. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you missed part of the show, you can check out our archives at scholarcircle.org, kpfk.org, and please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Armudian, and we'll see you next week.